Breaking tonight, new extremism from the left in the wake of Brett Kavanaugh's swearing in as the 114th Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. What a week and what a night. We are live in New York with Tammy Bruce, Lisa Booth, Greg Jarrett, Charlie Kirk. Evening everyone and welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton and this is the home of positive populism. And positive is surely the word to describe this week. President Trump delivering after the election exactly what he promised before the election. Another constitutionalist on the Supreme Court committed to the separation of powers and reining in the anti-democratic rule of unaccountable bureaucracy. But also this week, historic low unemployment, especially for African Americans and Hispanic Amer Americans. The independent head of the Federal Reserve this week calling it the best economy in modern history. NAFTA renegotiated this week with a positive pro-worker replacement. China confronted this week, put on notice by the Trump administration, that after years of appeasement, its authoritarian aggression, aggression will not stand. And yet, in this of all weeks, the left go lower than we've ever seen before, with hate and bigotry and violence. So, to discuss all that, let's meet our guest tonight, Fox News contributor Lisa Booth. Founder of Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk. Author of the new book, Campus Battlefield. Fox News contributor and president of Independent Women's Voice, Tammy Bruce. And Fox News legal analyst and author of the bestseller, The Russia Hoax, The Illicit Scheme to Clear Hillary Clinton and Frame Donald Trump, Greg Jarrett. So Tammy, we've... Um, it's so great to be with you here together in the same studio yeah, in New York. Nice we were often um, separated over the ether. Yeah. So I'm going to start with you. There's a number of false narratives that have been pushed in the wake of this Kavanaugh thing, and I'm going to pick on a few of them and, mm -hmm. and give, give them to each of you to respond. First you, Tammy, there's this story being told that if you are for Kavanaugh and, and are happy about what's happened, mm -hmm. then you're against women. You're yeah. anti-women. Sure. Uh, look, but that's, this is not new. It's interesting the conversation is, is that the left has suddenly lost their minds. That's been the approach from the start. When I was on the left, that was the approach. We would laugh at conservatives because we knew they would not defend themselves. We knew we could right. say whatever we wanted uh, because, and I hope I'm making up for those years through the last uh, several. <laughs> you are. Well, 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 we'll let it slide. This was why this last I experience was so fabulous. Finally seeing a president who did not abandon someone because they were accused of being a misogynist or accused of being against women. Uh, so I know that this is not a new approach. It was just much more blatant. It's the difference between slapping someone and punching them in the face. Mm. We've been slapped for, for generations and suddenly they just lost their temper and slugged us. Now many people need to see it in that fashion. Uh, the Republicans, of course, uh, had to follow Trump's uh, uh, lead because he would not withdraw him and Judge Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, made it clear in his uh, answer to the charges that he was not going to withdraw. Suddenly the Republicans had to act. So this is what the American people saw also, was that when you're, when you're attacked and when you're uh, obviously, uh, in, I believe, falsely accused, uh, you must stand up for yourself. And that's what has been, I think, the enveloping message of the president's uh, uh, agenda. Yeah. Standing up for America, making America great again, defending ourselves. That is not the, the wrong thing to do. It is the right thing to do. And, and I think for the left... This is what they are. This is the natural thing that they've done. It's not new, and it will not end. And we're going to get to more of that later in the show, because I think one of the most interesting things about this whole saga has been the behavior of the left. But, Greg, let me bring you in here and put to you another one of these narratives that's being put out there, which is that with this appointment and this confirmation, I've seen this phrase all over the place, this is a hard right turn for the court. It seems to me that that narrative totally misunderstands the Constitution and the whole point of the court, which is not to be right or left, but to interpret the law, not to make it. That's right. For far too long, uh, liberal activist judges have legislated from the bench, and we've seen that from the United States Supreme Court. So this is really a rebalancing of what justices should be. Constitutionalists interpret the law according to that esteemed document. Uh, but here we see Jerry Nadler and Nancy Pelosi who are threatening to exact revenge by impeaching Kavanaugh with a further investigation. They don't realize it, but that's actually a gift to Republicans. It will further anger and alienate 
many in the electorate, and the polling data is already indicating uh, that Republicans are newly energized and motivated to get out to vote in uh, November to make sure mm -hmm. that this sort of thing doesn't happen. Interesting. And Lisa, let's um, look at one other aspect of it, more, more specifically within the realm of the, imp the impact on gender and, and what we were discussing there with Tammy about being for or against women, the Me Too movement. It's, this, this comes a year on from the start of the Me Too movement. This is the other thing that's being said, isn't it? That, that it, unless you're with Christine Blasey Ford, you're against the whole Me Too movement. Well, and I got that a lot. Well, I mean, I, I am against the Me Too movement because I, I think it's a mob now, and that's not the kind of society I want to live in. I don't want to live let's, in a let's country. Let's be precise. Ag against the I'm against what it tackling become. the importance of sexual violence Shame. and assault. I, I'm, against, I'm against what it has become. I think it, it, it had it served a purpose initially where far too long women felt that they could not bring these kind of accusations forward and they would not be met or taken seriously or any action would have been done. So I think it had a purpose, but now we've overcorrected and it's become mm -hmm. this mob mentality and we saw that with Brett Kavanaugh and I have never been so fired up about yeah. something that I have these past couple weeks because there, there's been something that's just been so unjust and so disgusting and what really I find so despicable is you look at the Senate Judiciary Committee you have so many people on that committee are former prosecutors that know the law that former attorney generals like Kamala Harris they know darn well that there would be zero case to bring against uh, Brett Kavanaugh, just like Rachel Mitchell pointed out, the 25-year mm -hmm. prosecutor, she said that, and he said, she said cases are very difficult to prosecute. This is weaker than that, that no prosecutor would bring this forward. They know that, yet they weaponize these allegations without any proof to try to destroy a man and his family. And I just find that so disgraceful. And just on a visceral level, it really moved me and impacted me. And I think it did for a lot of viewers at That's home. That's exactly right. And we, we both got fired up last week, didn't we? And, I, <laughs> and I, it was interesting. I, the reaction to that was, was very strong. It's like, yes, you're speaking for us. That's how we feel about it, too. Charlie. Um, one more thing, I keep hearing that this is some kind of primal howl of um, the Republican base, which is all old white men. So I'm looking at you now. I don't think of you as an old, uh, well, not all of those adjectives. Old white men. I mean, what's that about? Well, first and foremost, the left is obsessed with race. Make no mistake. I mean, they're, 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 they can't, they can't help themselves, but always bring in these artificial constructs into this conversation. This is about the interpretation of the rule of law. And you remember back to the Clarence Thomas hearing. Who are the people that were accosting him? It was Joe Biden. It was Ted Kennedy. Those are the people that were saying that he shouldn't deserve to come on the court. And to your brilliant point, Tammy, he stood and fought, mm -hmm. and it ended. Brett Kavanaugh stood and fought, and then the, the base said, oh, wait, we're allowed to fight? We haven't done that in a long time. This president has given our party the courage and the conviction to fight and win. It's as if our party, look at Lindsey Graham, we forgot how to fight. We always kind of just rolled over yeah. and tried to appease the middle. And finally, we have fought, we have won, and now the, 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 the court is back to a 5-4 constitutional majority. That's it's not right. even a it's conservative not right or, left. or liberal. It's about the rule of exactly. law. So ju I mean, you're out on campuses the whole time. I mean, the idea that, that young people, that there's no young people that sort of um, it's, buy into these arguments. It's not even close to being true. We had an event, a Turning Point USA event, at Colorado University Boulder. Over 1,000 students attended. And this was during the Kavanaugh controversy. It's roaring applause when we talk about due process, cross-examination of witnesses, and the rule of law. Because I'll tell you why. Because there are people on college campuses that see themselves in Brett Kavanaugh, wrongfully accused about anything, whether it be cheating on a test, or not being at a party, or disobeying curfew. Everyone in the, somewhere in life has been wrongfully accused of something, and well, they see in Brett Kavanaugh. And we've got now, of course, big conversations about prison reform and justice reform. Mm -hmm. Well, then the left is arguing for an end to the presumption of innocence, and on the other right. side, they, they, they're arguing about the need for, for justice and prison reform, uh, which relies on due process. Uh, and when you think about, will anyone talk about Emmett Till? Uh, maybe somebody has just read To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, right. the, the core American value about defending the accused, uh, because that's what fairness sits in, and the ability for us to trust the end result of criminal trials and those with whom we, uh, uh, with whom we, we punish uh, with whatever our system can bring. And especially, and this is it also about women, women who are victims especially rely on due process because we must be believed. We are reliant on the system taking us seriously and we can't be taken mm. seriously if false allegations or questionable allegations, which, which we would need to apply due process to, 
never get a serious hearing. So, Greg, last word to you on, on, on this um, part of the discussion. I mean, we barely, we've got no time to talk about the details, but all this comes, as I noted earlier, at a time when you've just got this incredible drumbeat of, of success, economic success, and the president moving forward on, in relation to trade and China and a whole range of other things on exactly the agenda that he promised. That's, it, I mean, any way you look at it, it feels like this has got to be one of the most successful first two years of, of any presidency ever. But you don't hear any of that, right? Well, that's true. And in fact, it was largely overlooked this week when the president, uh, well, basically had the best week of his presidency, the lowest unemployment rate since 1969, uh, the most robust economy, according to the Federal Reserve. Uh, a new trade deal with Mexico and Canada. Uh, and he stood up to China this week. And of course, he, he was able to get the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh through the United States Senate. So a week of incredible accomplishments, but all you hear from special interest groups and activists and protesters are uh, character assassination and unconscionable smears. And, and that was really the most important thing that Susan Collins said in her floor speech. She condemned uh, the distortions by these people and said quite clearly that insofar as their outrageous behavior is concerned, that backfired on yep. her. She repeated it tonight in a 60 Minutes interview that the political threats she's been receiving, she called them at one point extortion, uh, had uh, steeled her determination. Uh, to make sure that the Kavanaugh confirmation was fair, mm -hmm. resulting in her vote in favor. Interesting. Well, th thanks for that, Craig. Um, and stay there, because we really want your perspective on an important discussion we've got coming up later in the show on the new idea on the left, which is packing the court. Coming up, more on the Kavanaugh confirmation, including my take on the frightening new authoritarianism of the left. Don't go away. The political philosopher Hannah Arendt, one of the greatest thinkers about authoritarianism, once observed that the political left always goes to motive, always argues that its opponents are not just wrong, but evil. Remember that, it's important. We keep being told that the Kavanaugh confirmation process has further intensified America's political polarization, for which blame lies on both sides. As I said last week, I can't stand partisanship and hope to help build a cross-party movement behind the ideas of positive populism. But right now, at this moment, one party stands in the way of that with its extremism, hate and rage. No, it is not both sides. It is one side. You've never heard a Republican leader talk about Democrats like this. He has been uh, uh, racist. He's been sexist. He's been... Islamophobic. He has been uh, anti-LGBTQ. Uh, I mean, there's a long list. It, it, I don't think it's useful to say, oh, we figured it out. This is what he is. He has a view of America that is incredibly constricted. And he talks to that America. He talks to them all the time. And it's by no means a majority, as we know, um, but it is a very hardcore who are responding to him and supporting him. That America, honestly. You've never seen a Republican senator say anything like this. Please, get up in the face of some Congress people. And when exactly did a Republican representative ever do this? Did you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd, and you push back on them, and you tell them they're not welcome. These daily scenes of mayhem and violence, how many of those hate-filled faces are conservatives, do you think? No, it is not both sides. It is one side. It is one side that started this cycle of hate. And no, it was not Mitch McConnell blocking Merrick Garland. Here's the senator who first stated that no Supreme Court justice should be appointed in a presidential election year. President Bush should consider following the practice of a majority of his predecessors and not, and not, name a nominee until after the November election is completed. 
Here's the senator who ended the 60-vote filibuster rule that promoted bipartisanship on judicial appointments. To change the rules regarding presidential nominees will apply equally to both parties. When Republicans are in power, these changes will apply to them just as well. That, Mr. President, is simple fairness. <laughs> simple fairness. And here's the senator who threw out centuries of bipartisan advice and consent tradition and vowed to block a Supreme Court nominee within hours of his announcement before a single second of testimony, before a single case had been reviewed. Well, I will oppose him with everything I've got. And now, who's escalating the arms race of hate? Last time I looked, this man was a Democratic presidential candidate, not a Republican. I believe that our party, the Democratic Party, must be a party that fights fire with fire. When they go low, I say, we hit harder. Sure enough, the left are now saying that Justice Kavanaugh must be impeached or the Supreme Court packed. We'll have more on that later in the show because he's too political. But I don't remember conservatives calling for the impeachment of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg over this. Quote, I can't imagine what this place would be. I can't imagine what the country would be with Donald Trump as our president, said the justice. For the country, it could be four years. For the court, it could be... I don't even want to contemplate that. Now it's time for us to move to New Zealand. And it's not that supposed authoritarian, that great underminer of democratic norms, Donald Trump, calling for packing of the court. It's the Democrats. Yes, we're in polarized times, but no, it is not both sides. Conservative academics, however much they disagree with liberals, simply don't talk like this left-wing professor at Georgetown University. Quote, Look at this chorus of entitled white men justifying a serial rapist's arrogated entitlement. All of them deserve miserable deaths while feminists laugh as they take their last gasps. Bonus. We castrate their corpses and feed them to swine. Yes? By the way, that's not even remarkable anymore. Remember Kathy Griffin? Remember Snoop Dogg? And now... A new low as the loony left drags the Democratic Party inexorably into the gutter. Senator Susan Collins, who over 21 years in the Senate, has sponsored 28 bills on sexual violence, who has been an outspoken champion for women's rights, who even as she voted on Brett Kavanaugh spoke powerfully about her hope that the confirmation process would lead to more justice for sexual assault victims. This decent, sincere and thoughtful woman, an absolute credit to our politics, was described by the Women's March as a rape apologist. The Women's March is not a fringe organization. It's endorsed by countless Democratic members of Congress. They own that. When President Trump allowed the populist movement to be tainted by the neo-Nazis of Charlottesville, I spoke out against it on this network, on this show. So where are you, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Kirsten Gillibrand, and all the other self-righteous, sanctimonious charlatans and hypocrites who constantly lecture the rest of us about bigotry and xenophobia? Will you speak out against this hate? If you don't condemn it, you're part of it. Of course they won't condemn it, because hate is the left's currency. Hate is their energy. Hate is their path to power. Just as Hannah Arendt said, xenophobia means suspicion and hatred of people who are different. It is the very definition of the modern Democratic Party. Their brand is hate, and if they win, it will get worse. November is coming, they chanted on the steps of the Supreme Court. Yes, it is. So let's use it to show these divisive, destructive Democrats that extremism, hate and rage will not win in America. Let me know what you think of that at Steve Hilton X and at Next Rev FNC. What do we think of that? Well, I think President Trump has this unique gift where he pushes people to a point where they unmask themselves and they show who they really are. And I think we saw that with the left. There is no low low enough for the left that they were perfectly 
willing to destroy an innocent man in the name of politics or political retribution for Mayor Garland or in the name of abortion or whatever else it is. And there was no low enough. And we know that they weaponized these baseless allegations. We know that Senate Democrats went out and tried to find accusers like Ronan Farrow said mm -hmm. and it, about his New Yorker piece, which, mind you, even after interviewing something like 70 people, not a single person came forward to corroborate Deborah Ramirez's story. Yet the left ran with it. And it didn't matter to them. I think President Trump so succinctly said this the other day when he said, you don't give a match to an arsonist and you don't give power to a left wing angry mob. Yes. And I think Americans are sitting back right now after witnessing this process and realizing how dangerous the left truly is. Well, and, and here's the important part. We as conservatives always try to appeal to the better angels of Democrats. Oh, we probably have a lot to agree on. We just have a different yes, way to get I've there. Yes, I've tried to do that a I'm, lot. We're done with I, that. I, I'm telling how you I right feel. now, we're done with that. I, this, These that's people that's do not want, want what's best for this country. They want power. They want this president impeached and put in prison. I'm sick and tired of saying that Democrats want what's best for America. They don't. They don't believe in the America of free speech, of free markets, of dialogue, and agree to disagree. They want power, and they want to destroy anyone that disagrees with them. That is not a liberal value. That is a leftist value. There's a, dis there's a, there's mm -hmm. a distinction there. And we, have to, we as the decent-minded people, have to keep the moral high ground and not give them an inch on it. Well, and I think the moral high ground is, in fact, fighting back. But let's remember, the party itself has been what's been pushed so far to the left abandoning their their uh, the average democrat the average right. uh, classical liberal and so this is what i would uh, i would submit that in fact you're correct there is no real division there's not two sides doing this but i contend that the country itself is not divided that you had 200 people fight you know out in front of the supreme court that is not a mass movement and as we're looking at this shocked so are women who might be Democrats, who maybe are now identifying as independents, looking at that thinking, well, this is not a real uh, alternative to what's going on. And besides, things are going well. Who are these people? And they're represented and, and their main leadership. There is no one in leadership in the Democratic Party saying forcefully, this is unacceptable yeah. because they've lost control of that dynamic. Uh, I would also suggest that the polls that we see, we know the enthusiasm gaps risen for, for Republicans. What would be, it would be a mistake to suggest that the Democrats are responding positively to what this is. And so if I tell my radio audience, and I would tell everyone watching this, yeah. have faith in your neighbor. You are not the only one who thinks this, and don't think that your neighbor is the enemy or not having the same reaction. I think okay. they are. I think that's a great summary. Thank you all. Um, coming up, Democrats want vengeance, just as Tammy was saying, over Brett Kavanaugh, and they're planning to pack the Supreme Court to restore a liberal majority, as they call it, in 2020. A leading advocate of that idea joins us next. Don't miss it. Welcome back, everyone. We know that Democrats are enraged about losing the 2016 election and the Kavanaugh confirmation battle. Over on MSNBC, Chris Matthews summed up the mood pretty nicely. The base will attack the leadership for this if they allow it to happen, and they should, because this is time for vengeance for what happened two years ago. Vengeance, yes indeed, and here's the plan. Nowhere does it say the Supreme Court has to be made up of nine justices, not in the Constitution, not in any amendment, nowhere. And that fact makes the idea of court packing possible. First discussed 80 years ago by FDR, court packing means adding extra judges to the High Court to create a new ideological majority. It may sound crazy, and it goes along with other democratic ideas to change the rules of the game when they're losing, like abolishing the Electoral College and reducing the number of red state senators. But believe me, court packing will be a mainstream idea on the left by the 2020 election. In fact, Michael Avenatti, yes, him again, called for it just yesterday. Someone else who's argued for it publicly is David Farris, who's a political science professor at Roosevelt University and author of It's Time to Fight Dirty, How Democrats Can Build a Lasting Majority in American Politics. And David Farris joins me now. David, um, presumably you, you've made this argument that you want the, Democrat, the Democratic um, president, as you hope it will be in 2020, to add another two to make it 11. Uh, you'd be all right with a Republican president in 2024 or 2028, boosting it up to 13. You'd be okay with that, right? Well, uh, w one thing I want to say, and uh, I've said this in everything I've written about this subject publicly, is that what I really want, what I'd really prefer, and I hate to disappoint you, is a compromise. Um, and the compromise would be a constitutional amendment that eliminates lifetime tenure on the Supreme Court. 
Um, that amendment would work a series of like magical things, okay? It would r reduce the zero-sum character of court appointments and court nominations. And it would allow the, the Supreme Court to more closely reflect the outcome of presidential elections, right? Um, and so that we could reduce the temperature on these appointments uh, by guaranteeing every president the right to nominate two justices per four-year term. So, but yes, you're right. I think if that compromise is rejected, then I do endorse expanding the Supreme Court by at least two seats, um, depending on how many it takes to, to produce a liberal majority okay. in 2021. Just to be clear, you also support um, a Republican president increasing by another two seats afterwards, yes? I don't see much of a functional difference between what Sorry, we have now. Sorry, is that a yes? Um, yes, I do, yeah. yeah, yeah so you're course. okay with the Republican uh, so, president doing it? What I would say is that the difference between... I'm just trying uh, to understand you know, what, if you're okay with it, if a Republican president does it or not. Yeah, I, I already said yes, but what I'm trying to say is that the so difference between what we have now and the difference between Republican escalation <laughs> is, is nothing, right? Like, if, if Democrats increase the size of the court, they'll control the court for two years or four years or eight years or whatever it is. Republicans will respond, right? And then we'll have control of the court okay. flipping back so I think and forth you've just made the based on the winner of the presidential perfectly. election. Sorry, to, sorry to, to, to cut you off there, but I think you've just made the argument perfectly why this is such a sort of total mis... Look, even I, as a, as a British person, new, relatively newly here, understand that, that the, purpo the, the, the whole point of the Supreme Court is to be different to the uh, branches that, to the, to the branch that is part of democratic politics. It's not supposed to reflect some po the political moment. It's supposed to judge the law, not make the law. Aren't you arguing for something that is totally at odds with the whole basis of the court? No, I'm not. Um, and what I would point out is that um, if you have a, uh, have a constitutional amendment that gives every president the right to appoint two justices per four-year term, uh, we would reduce the partisan anger around these appointments because it would make it possible for you to recapture the court uh, in four or eight years. Right? Hang on, aren't you asking? What Democrats are, are, really fear? What Democrats really fear? Partisan? No. I, anyway, <laughs> the look, constitutional let, amendment I would make it less partisan. In, I want to get the others in on this, and, and then we'll come back to you, David. If you don't mind hanging, hanging on there for a second, let's start with sure. Greg. Um, what, what do you make of this? <laughs> well, it's it's silly. You know, by Mr. Ferris's reasoning, we, we could end up adding additional justices every four years whenever there's a new president arguably elected. So, um, look, it's a practical impossibility, and here's why, as you pointed out in your intro. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt tried this in 1937 by adding six additional justices. It requires, however, as FDR found out, a legislative act, a bill passed by both houses of Congress and signed by the president, his efforts were viewed as so devious and underhanded, even by Democrats, that his bill didn't even get out of committee. It's anathema to the principles that have been established since 1869 when nine justices became the rule. So, Tammy, you were very uh, fired up during that conversation. Well, uh, it, it's quite disingenuous, I think. Look, there's a reason why it's a lifetime appointment, so that you are not vulnerable to political pressure. That's the entire point. That's, this is what you don't want them to have to deal with. This is a deliberative body. It should not be a responsive body or a reactionary body, and yet it is a reflection of how the left views it, which is their implementer of their social justice, their social change. They've used the courts, in fact, to do that because they can't convince the American people on the merits. Yeah. I would also argue that this argument, as was uh, Roosevelt's, was uh, part of the action is to intimidate the sitting judges now to suggest that if if you do not it's like a a, a batterer if you do not comply we will hurt you so and i think that is the underlying argument about what this it really I, is sorry, all about. i just want to bring david back in on that point because i think it's the crucial point it's it, it, it it's not supposed to be this body that that is political in the way that you want it to be right but uh i think that we can see from what's happening in our politics today that the fact that Supreme Court justices have lifetime tenure means that these battles take on this like uh, really uh, terrible significance in our politics. Um, it's, it, it creates a zero-sum battle over these court appointments. And if you just amended the Constitution, okay, let, you could actually also do it with a simple but, law. Okay, thanks, you would David. Reduce, Sorry, we don't have too much time. The, you made that point very that. clearly. Let me get uh, Charlie and Lisa in quickly. Charlie really quick, and, uh, Tammy made a great point, but what is a judge? Is a judge an activist or is it an interpretation of the law? See, we believe that the, the judge should be an independent arbiter in an interpretation of the law. They think it should be a political activist to advance their agenda. He's upset 
because we have five justices now that will look at what the text says, not what they hope it says. This is a war on the Constitution. This is a war on the rule of law. And he's unsettled that we can't get Medicare for all or free housing or free health care quick enough because that's a threat to his well, own political Lisa, agenda. Also, his book is called It's Time to Fight Dirty, so you sort of see where he's <laughs> Thank coming you, Lisa. from, obvious Thank point. You. Also, elections have consequences, and you know how many people Hillary Clinton has confirmed to the Supreme Court? Zero, because she lost. President Trump has had two because he won. That is how it works. And this is what Democrats do, as you pointed out earlier. When they lose, they try to change the game. When Bingo. President Trump won, oh, we have to get rid of the Electoral College. And then also calling for defectors, faithless uh, uh, electors to defect. And get, or for fa blah, 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 faithless electors. Yeah, you know, I think but but right. what's That's hilarious is that more people went against Hillary Clinton with that than President Trump. So it backfired okay, so in her face with that. One correction. Mr. Ferris continues to say that this division in this dynamic, there is no division. It's only the Democrats that get upset. We've never done that. <laughs> okay. Nobody else has had Sorry. a problem. Uh, thanks, Sarah. David, there's one other thing. You know, I've just got to say, thanks for coming on and debating it. Uh, but uh, uh, when, the, when, when uh, the, the left's reaction to leaders in other countries, whether that's, you know, Erdogan in Turkey or the populists in, when it's populists doing it in Hungary, trying to mess around with the ju judiciary, they're suddenly, they're authoritarians and they're tearing up the rule of law, but you want to do it here. I, so I don't know. I, I think it feels very self-serving, but I appreciate you coming on to debate it. Thank you very much. Coming up, the frightening prospect of the divisive, destructive, hate-filled Democrats taking control of Congress is just 30 days away. The latest on key races next. For a Trump Republican, a Bush Republican, a McCain Republican, a Libertarian or a Vegetarian, you're pissed. I have never seen the Republican Party so unified as I do right now. That right there is Lindsey Graham 2.0, the best upgrade ever. Polls show Republicans getting a bump after the stunt the Democrats pulled on Brett Kavanaugh. And that's going to be the first topic for my panelists in tonight's rundown. Each topic gets one minute today. Clocks don't care about your feelings. Joining me today, senior producer at The Daily Signal, Kelsey Harkness, Fox News contributor and head of research at Bustle, Jessica Tarloff, and podcast host at The Daily Wire, the execrable Michael Knowles. He works with me, so I can say that. All right, <laughs> let's start. So, guys, was it the right move for the GOP to confirm Kavanaugh? I'll start with you, Kelsey. Absolutely. If the GOP didn't confirm Kavanaugh, they would have set a very dangerous precedent in this country. Not just that allegations not grounded in actual evidence or, or cooperation uh, can derail you from a, uh, from a seat on the Supreme Court, but also that it can ruin your entire life. Democrats absolutely overplayed their hands in this. We knew they were already motivated in the midterms. Republicans were in trouble. Now they're united like never before and fired up. They're going to you're going to see him at the polls. Now, Jessica, I know you disagree with this, obviously. So Only like 99% of it, <laughs> which is a rarity. Uh, the GOP certainly should have gotten Kavanaugh confirmed for their own interests and for what's going to happen in November. I think that enthusiasm gap bump is real and serious, and we have to hope as Democrats that they forget about this in the next 30 days or so. Um, in terms of what this means for America and the precedent that I think that it has set, I would encourage everyone to actually listen to Lisa Murkowski. I know everyone is loving Susan Collins, but I think Lisa Murkowski said some very powerful things about the importance of judicial temperament and faith in institutions. And I would also like to point out she is the only uh, GOP senator, female senator, who is a, Repu who is a lawyer. Well, Michael, I get to your opinion, but I don't care about it. But the next topic, I spoke this week at USC. A few hundred protesters actually showed up outside, which isn't surprising. That's usually how it goes. Our colleges are broken. One of the most insane stories, my favorite, this week, featured an attempt by USC students to get a USC professor, James Moore, fired for simply telling students that due process ought to apply to Brett Kavanaugh. At the University of Wisconsin, students launched a website called Make Them Scared UW with a list of unverified sexual abuse allegations against various students. So are college students really going to go along with the radical side of the Me Too movement? We'll start with you, Michael, since you didn't get any chance to speak last time, which was great, but we'll go to you this time. <laughs> Wonderful, of course. Well, look at the example that's being set for them by Senate Democrats. Of course this is going to get worse. There are two problems here. One is the, the hookup culture. If the hookup culture is the 1960s free love, Me Too is the 1970s hangover. The other is a lack of civic education. So now we've had major rape hoaxes at universities, UVA, uh, Hofstra, all over the country, University of Wyoming, and yet we have more 
kangaroo courts, more campus tribunals. This has gone all the way up to Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Unfortunately, college students don't understand due process. They don't understand presumption of innocence. And I don't see either of those problems getting better in the near future. And Kelsey, what do you make of it? A lot of Americans don't realize that the country was quite divided on the Me Too movement prior to the Kavanaugh confirmation. Uh, only half of millennial women had faith in the movement. Clearly, women are even more divided now than ever. I think you're right that college students are uh, taking a more radical interpretation. That's only going to get worse. You're going to have a lot of fun in your future visits to college <laughs> campuses. Okay. On the other hand, <laughs> the Me Too movement is losing a lot of conservative women who wanted to be a part of it but cannot get on board with this radical interpretation of it. Well, coming back, we'll have more with our wonderful rundown panel. So early on in the program, I said there was another story I liked the most. I lied. This is the best story, not only of today, but in human history. Three professors joined forces to perpetuate one of the great hoaxes of all time. They submitted 20 fake papers on topics ranging from heteronormativity at dog parks to fat bodybuilding to a number of prestigious <laughs> academic journals. Seven of these were actually published. The authors concluded that grievance studies have politically biased standards. Shock and that deconstructionist ideas have essentially destroyed the liberal arts. So, are our universities savable? Let's ask our panel. We'll start with you, Jessica. They're totally savable. I am an ivory tower product myself, and I wouldn't have written any of those papers. I, I just, <laughs> I, and I listened to... They're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they are crazy, and I was political science anyway. But I listen to conservatives sit around all the time complaining about this. Go out get your degrees, get your PhD, you go and teach, you publish papers on the things that you think are important to talk about. I understand some of this sounds ridiculous, but this idea that our universities aren't educating people probably, I completely agree with what you're saying, that's more civics. Yeah. Um, but it seems, for all the power that conservatives have, certainly in America today, in politics, and across the board, a lot of money, why are you complaining all the time? Because they won't give us the PhD. Seriously. They won't, actual, really? Yes, because the people who are professors actually have to approve PhDs. And you're not going to get anyone to approve your dissertation about why the Second Amendment's a great idea. But I'll, I'll, I'll let our Yale grad here talk to this. <laughs> yeah, that's like uh, the worst campus of all for these kind of crazy <laughs> things. It's true. They won't give you the PhD and they won't give you tenure either. So it ends up going on and on and on. When I was at Yale, I actually uh, you had this blog where we would just use direct quotes from gender studies these papers because they were so farcical, vegetarian, eco-feminisms, that kind of thing. That said, I think there is a lot of hope. There is a demand out there. If, if in the 1990s we had known that the right could take over media, could have a foothold in the mainstream media, we would have been shocked. Three years ago, if we knew that we could get these policy wins, these judicial wins, we would have been shocked. I think there's a demand. So you admit that conservatives aren't the victims here, and you guys are actually No, we are the victims, well. but we're going to fight what back the against victim? the bullies. Is what we're hey, Kelsey, what, what, what's oh, yeah. your take? This is sort of an emperor has no clothes moment for universities and for these academic journals. This story uh, published by the Wall Street Journal originally, good investigation there. You don't know whether to laugh or cry while you're reading it. And I, I think that universities, if they're savable, they really need to take a hard look in the mirror. Um, we know over at Brown just a couple months ago and uh, an article promoting a research paper about transgender ideology was pulled simply because certain people didn't like the end results of that study. Are they savable? I'm certainly a half glass full kind of girl, but I'm very worried and I think there's a lot of work to do. There's a big fight ahead. Well, we're not going to get to the last topic because I blew through the clock. That one's on me, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but coming up on our last segment for the night, a look at the reality of abortion and how polarizing an issue it actually is. Stay tuned. In all of the chaos regarding the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh, we should remember one simple fact. If Kavanaugh were pro-choice, he would have been confirmed with 100 votes. He's clearly not an advocate for abortion, but Democrats didn't have the votes to stop him. So instead, Democrats decided to slander him as a gang rapist. Remember, Democratic opposition to Kavanaugh started not with Christine Blasey Ford, but with women in Handmaid's Tale outfits occupying the Senate confirmation hearing room and pro-abortion protesters being dragged out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's not a shock that Planned Parenthood, the organization responsible for hundreds of thousands of abortions per year, openly threatens senators in poetry, quote, Roses are red, violets are blue, 
Senators vote no on Kavanaugh or else we're coming for you. Hashtag National Poetry Day. Hashtag Stop Kavanaugh. Now that's romance. Abortion, to the vast majority of the political left, is a sacrament. It's not merely a political issue. It is a defining character issue. If you are pro-abortion, you are a good, generous, decent person who values women. If you are pro-life, you are an evil, repressive, nasty person who wants to control women's bodies. It's that view that leads to incidents like this one, in which a pro-life advocate was kicked in the face by a pro-abortion nutcase this week. It's a baby. Yeah. It's someone who's raped and she gave birth and she decided to kill her three-year-old child. Oh, I meant to get your phone! The pro-abortion movement suggests that pro-lifers are extreme. In reality, the extreme position on abortion is held by the Democratic Party. Their platform calls for legal abortion all the way until point of birth. But pro-abortion extremists get away with their rhetoric because they use euphemistic language to describe what exactly abortion is. In fact, the word abortion is itself a euphemism. The procedure of abortion isn't an anodyne polyp removal. It involves doing terminal violence to an unborn child. Ignoring that fact allows abortion advocates to avoid looking reality directly in the face. So, for just a few moments, let's look reality in the face. This is a picture of a 19-week-old baby. This is a human child. This is not a ball of goo. This is not a cluster of cells. In January, 44 Democrats in the United States Senate voted not to protect the rights of babies older than this unborn child. Only three Democrats, Joe Manchin, Joe Donnelly, and Bob Casey, voted to protect children at 20 weeks. Only two Republicans voted against such protection, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. Take a good look at that baby. That is a human being with zero rights, according to the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And human life doesn't begin at 20 weeks. This is a picture of a baby at 12 weeks, barely three months. You can see this baby with his hands near his chest. This is not a cluster of cells. This is not a ball of goo. His genitalia have already been formed. His liver and spleen produce red blood cells. This is an unborn human being. Not a single federally elected Democrat would vote for an abortion ban that would protect this baby's life. And life doesn't begin at 14 weeks. This is a picture of an unborn human being at eight weeks. You can identify the head of this unborn human. You can see where the small buds are forming for arms and legs. But guess what? Life doesn't begin at eight weeks either. It begins at fertilization, when a new human life is formed, a new human being with its own DNA. This human being is not its mother, it is not its father, it is not a polyp. If we found a human embryo on another planet,